Coming up, experts are calling for greater support for native farmers. A Stockbridge Muncie composer's work is performed in Venice, plus a new children's book teaches traditional values. I am Aliyah Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona PBS is proud to support Indian Country Today. For six decades, we've provided television programs and now digital content. But we go beyond that, sending outreach teams across Arizona, offering workshops in language and literacy, family engagement and community outreach, and supporting tribal communities with early learning and school readiness resources. Join us at azpbs.org. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. I'm at Awahopa. Thank you for joining us. We start in California, where the state will soon observe a holiday honoring indigenous people. On Friday, September 23rd, all state employees will have the day off for California Native American Day, and they will get paid for it. Last year, Assemblymember James Ramos passed legislation that designated the fourth Friday of September as the holiday. This year, Ramos pushed that a step further. Now, state employees, including court personnel, are getting the getting paid to observe the holiday. This news was highlighted Wednesday at a press conference in San Bernardino. Today, we're here. We're here standing strong for all of our ancestors and the atrocity that has been inflicted upon them to once and for all have a paid holiday to recognize the contributions and the attributions, contributions by the California Indian people to the state of California. And we start with the first paid holiday in the state of California. The press conference also included an honor song from a group of bird singers, which is something Ramos has taken part in for years. He is the first and only Native person serving in the California State Legislature. Earlier this week, organizers celebrated National Voter Registration Day. That included an organization in Arizona. ICT Sierra Alvarez was there and has all of the action. This celebration is a civic event that has been occurring since 2012 to encourage people to get out and vote. There were many different vendors at this event in Phoenix, all with the same goal of registering people to vote. Some people got creative with their ideas. There was even a smoothie truck for participants. The event started off with a walk. Nice leisurely walk. <laughs> Organizers say this is to recognize the connection between a healthy body and mind. This year, the Phoenix Indian Center, which was first started in 1947, followed the slogan, The Power of the Native Vote. Here in Arizona specifically, within the last major elections, there was a really great um, turnout from our Native voters, and we want to continue that momentum moving forward. Every person getting to the polls is extremely important. T-shirts were also given to participants to showcase this idea. June Shorthair is a civic engagement specialist at the Phoenix Indian Center. You know, the past few years, uh, if you look at the uh, results, we've really made some strides. Uh, if you look at the numbers, not only within the state of Arizona, across the nation, and even at the reservation their, uh, areas, they've also continued to increase. There was a rally with speakers talking about the power of Native participation in the political process. We all have opinions, and this is when it really matters. Um, your voice is your vote, and um, it is important to express how you feel and, and how you feel that we should be represented as a people. In Phoenix, Arizona, Sierra Alvarez, ICT News. According to data from Advanced Native Political Leadership, there are over one million Native people who are eligible to vote but are not registered. 
The largest school district on the Navajo Nation is becoming more energy efficient. Chinle Unified School District has just received its first of three electric school buses. This upgrade comes by way of a transportation modernization grant through the nonprofit A for Arizona. CUSD serves 3,300 students across eight schools, including the largest reservation high school in the U.S. Electric vehicle maker Bluebird says the buses can carry as many as 84 students for up to 120 miles on a single charge. Along with Student Impact, District Superintendent Quincy Nate says the EVs are cost efficient and they reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Moving forward, district officials say they, expe they expect to expand their use of these vehicles. Well, here's some news for any of you Native people wanting to learn more about animation. The Native American Media Alliance is hosting its fourth annual Animation Lab, and it is now accepting applications for this year. Participants who are accepted will work on a script or comic, then develop it into an animated film or series. Once completed, they will present their work to a board of animation executives. The workshop is hosted in partnership with big names like NBC Universal, Sony Pictures Animation, and the Cherokee Film Office. Ultimately, organizers hope this work will launch Native people into a career in animation. To find more information and links, visit ictnews.org and search for the headline, 4th Annual Native American Animation Lab Opens Call for Applications. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. I am Aliyah Chavez. The Native Farm Bill Coalition released a new report earlier this month. It included more than 150 policy changes for lawmakers to better support Native farmers and producers. Leading much of this research is the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative at the University of Arkansas's School of Law. Joining us today is the organization's Associate Director, Carly Griffith Hotfit. Hi, Carly. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Leah. Thanks for having me. So at a high level, tell us what the report Gaining Ground aims to do. So the Gaining Ground report is really intended to be reflective of Indian countries' needs. We met with stakeholder groups across the United States uh, with multiple tribes to receive the information about how Farm Bill policies and programs are impacting them. And we've heard some successes and we've heard some challenges and we were able to take that information and identify points in the farm bill that could be changed from a policy perspective to better serve Indian country stakeholders. And at a high level also provide some context for how much of an impact tribal nations make to the nation's agriculture uh, system. Sure. So uh, while we know that we're a smaller percentage of you know, overall producers when we look in the big scheme of agriculture, uh, indigenous producers and indigenous ran uh, farms and ranches and operations have continued to increase. Data reflected from the uh, uh, census of agriculture between 2012 to 2017 show significant growth across a variety of areas. And we also know that the location of our producers in the food ecosystems um, and economies uh, really serve a lot of underserved tribal communities. So when we talk about food deserts and when we talk about you know, gaps in value added agriculture, a lot of our operations are located in areas that are primed to be very influential. So while the numbers may not be uh, in the majority, we know that the work that's done by our indigenous producers in Indian country definitely serves our communities in ways that we are not otherwise. You're already talking about this already, but what are some of the main obstacles that indigenous producers face when trying to you know, provide food for indigenous communities? Sure. So a lot of the feedback that we have, um, and this is gonna be continued on our Native Farm Bill Coalition work uh, from the 2018 Farm Bill, is parity in Farm Bill meaning that anywhere where it says a state may or an organization may, we also wanna make sure it says and tribes, just so that tribes have the same access to programmatic offerings uh, through USDA, whether that is through the um, farm production mission area, whether it's uh, from access to credit, whether it is in rural development, commodities title or other types of programs, parity is really critical. We need to have a seat at the table and the same bite at the apple that every other um, agriculturalist has. Uh, with relation to USDA programs. And so that has a trickle through effect um, to support our uh, tribal communities, 
But we're also hearing about uh, the need for self-administration and self-governance through USDA programs, and we're really excited to be working on that as well. So I understand that this report will actually inform a legislation that will be introduced in the U.S. Congress. Has that legislation been introduced yet? And if not, who will introduce it? Sure. So what's happening right now and the way that the Farm Bill process works is the Farm Bill is a large omnibus piece of legislation. Last Farm Bill was over 1,200 pages, and that's a lot of information to be contained. So what happens in the lead up to the Farm Bill is there are bills that are called marker bills that will, will circulate through Congress, kind of identifying policy priorities that won't necessarily get passed on the full floor, but are essentially a test or a preview to what could be included in the Farm Bill. So we're going through the marker bill process currently, and we anticipate farm bill activity to really ramp up after midterms occur in November and the new Congress is sworn in. That's a great point. I mean, I want to actually talk about um, how this legislation could potentially be bipartisan. Are there particular issues um, that would support Indigenous farmers that are supported by both Democrats and Republicans? Sure. So there's quite a few uh, issues across the board that are supported uh, by you know both both sides of the aisle when we're talking about you know access and parity, um, especially through the self governance lens. So there are a multitude of topics, a multitude of areas um, where you know tribes have the opportunity to benefit. Uh, the Farm Bill and USDA is actually the largest funder of Indian Country. Over $4 billion is transferred um, through the Farm Bill um, to Indian Country producers and tribes, which is more than any other federal agency, including DOI or BIA or even IHS. And so when we're looking at opportunities for participation, I would say the majority of programs within the Farm Bill, because everybody has to eat, everybody has to have access to food, everybody needs an opportunity in creating a safe and stable food system with a focus on investment in local and regional economies is something that both parties can get behind. Carly, we only have a short time left here, but where can people find more information about this report? Sure. So to find more information on the report, you can check out nativefarmbill.com and there will be a link to the Gaining Ground report. And I have to say, Aaliyah, I'm so proud of our staff and our partners who have worked very hard on this. And it's a great opportunity to learn more. And we'll also be issuing supplemental materials because we will continue stakeholder outreach for updated policy recommendations. So keep an eye out for that as well. Carly Griffith Hotbit from the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative. Thank you so much. Hello. The Venice Biennale has made a commitment to decolonizing music. Last year, it featured George Lewis emphasizing how discrimination affects African Americans and Western music. This year, the music of Brent Michael Davids was featured and he joins us today. Welcome, Brent. Yeah, hello. Tell us how this performance came together. Somehow somebody heard about me and there was discussions behind the scenes and they decided to feature me on a concert at the Biennale with the Shenandoah Conservatory. Also, that's another first. Um, the the Biennale has never had a uh, like a, a conservatory school from America come perform a concert there before. So that's a first for them as well. Um, and then I I thought um, if we're going to go that way, you know, instead of just having a piece uh, of mine or several of my works or a new commission, because I was commissioned to write a, a piece of music, especially for the, the Venice event, um, you know, why not have other composers? So I, I started co-curating a concert with them to invite other native composers to join. So, and this is scholastic trained composition. So it'd be like what we call SATB chorus, which stands for, it's an acronym that stands for soprano, alto, tenor, bass. So, and it's, it's a, it's a literary tradition of composed music that's actually written down in, in like choral repertoire. So composers that do that, and there's several of us now, um, you know, we're invited to, you know, submit, you know, sort of by invitation only to submit. And then, uh, you know, uh, that some decisions were made with the, the Venice and uh, conservatory folks, and we came up with a program that was performed. So. Several, you know, Don Avery, uh, Russell Wallace, uh, Jennifer Stevens, and of course my old longtime friend Lewis Ballard, 
all had music performed at the festival. In addition to two of my older works for Chant to Clear, an internationally all-male chorus, and then also the new commissioned work, which is called Water People in the City of Water. So this is a shout out to my own tribe, the Stockbridge Muncie. We're Mohicans and, and Muncie Lenape here in Wisconsin, uh, displaced all the way from New York and Massachusetts. Um, we're known as the uh, Mohican actually means the river, the Hudson River. The indigenous name for it is, well, in Mohican, it's Mohicanuk because it's the place of the Mohicans. And then uh, from a Lenape or Muncie standpoint, it's called Mohicanatuk. Uh, it means the Mohicans place or the tidal river place. Um, so we're known as the water people, the river Indians. And so Venice is also known as the city of water. So the title is water people in the city of water. And I used it in my imagination to invent a scenario where what would, what if a bunch of Mohicans actually visited Venice? What would that sound like? It'd be all watery. And I wrote it in Mohican and Italian, both languages in Venice, how do you bring the strength of all of your ancestors with you intentionally in a performance like this? The composer that most people think of, and, and it's most the most popular one, are the performer composers. Like they compose on their own instrument, they play guitar, they sing, they compose for their voice, and they end up on stage performing quite often. Um, or jazz composers perform in a group and they're improvising on their instrument. What I do is classical, scholastically trained composition. It's more of a literary pursuit where we're writing the music down for other people to play. And it's a strenuous kind of thing and with delayed gratification. Um, you know, for instance, if I'm writing a symphony, it could take nine, 10 months to finish it and then another year before it's programmed. So it might be a two year delay. For an opera, it might be three years before one piece is performed where somebody in the studio can record and next week their album is coming out. It's a very different sort of uh, pursuit. So I wasn't actually there performing. It was for the chorus. They were reading the sheet music, soprano, alto, tenor, bass music, off sheet music and performing. So the trick is not uh, bringing performances to the stage. It's how do you work American Indian sensibilities and styles and values? How do you get that embedded into the written sheet music in a way that Non, uh, non-Indians and, and Indians can perform the music that's written on the page. And how, you know, so my job as a composer is how do I get native sensibilities, epistemologies, et cetera, culture, how do I get that written into the music, which is a, a, a whole nother puzzle altogether. And I've been working at this now for almost five decades. Um, I think I wrote my first music in the, in the mid seventies and still going strong today. Thank you so much for making that distinction for us. Um, we only have a short time left here, but tell us what's coming up next for you. Oh, I'm working on a big uh, Requiem for America, where um, I'm going to, you know, basically it's a, a, a dark piece about how America has been stolen. Every land in the country has been stolen. And uh, to create a Requiem for America, outlining all these different episodes in American history, and then try and have the music sung and performed full orchestra chorus, two choruses, a native indigenous chorus, plus an SATP uh, chorus, full orchestra, indigenous instruments, and have it performed in every state in the country is my goal, have one performance. And the requirement of the performance is that all the orchestras and choruses that work with each individual group in the states have to contact their local tribal entities and make friendships and collaborate with them so that uh, walls are broken down everywhere that the music is performed. So it sings of the problem that, you know, that there's a, a wall of separation between indigenous people and non-indigenous people around the country and we're swept under the rug and, and rendered invisible. But then the solution is kind of built in where all the performances are required to make contact with the local indigenous populations in order to enact the performances. Well, Brent Michael David, thank you so much. Thank you so much.
There's a new Red Lake Ojibwe picture book that teaches traditional values through a journey of three cousins. Elizabeth Barrett wrote it and Jonathan Thunder illustrated the book, but the inspiration actually came from Elizabeth's uncle, Thomas Barrett. Thomas joins us today and he's the CEO of the Red Lake Boys and Girls Club. Welcome, Thomas. Hey, bonjour, Leah. Thank you for having me. So tell us about this book and its storyline. So uh, this actually was born um, during the early days of the pandemic. Um, uh, when the pandemic hit, people were supposed to isolate at home. So for us at the Boys and Girls Club, we didn't have kids coming to our building. So we had to get creative with our programming. And um, we were doing virtual programming. We were sending activity packets home to the kids. And one of the activities was create your own book. So we would like, you know, have a title page and just, um, you know, empty pages for them to draw, to write a story, color, whatever it was. And um, the common themes we were getting back was uh, things around our Ojibwe culture. So, you know, the team got together and said um, to further this children's book uh, project, let's do it about the seven grandfather teachings. And the seven grandfather teachings are part of Anishinaabe culture and other um, indigenous cultures as well and their respect truth, wisdom, honesty, humility, courage, and love. So um, we eventually uh, partnered up with um, Elizabeth. I know she's my niece, so I know of her writing capabilities. She was fresh off uh, graduating from Dartmouth University in English literature. And John Thunder, um, he's uh, painted murals for our Boys and Girls Clubs. Uh, we have two Boys and Girls Clubs, one in the community of Red Lake and another in the community of Panema. And he's painted, um, you know, different murals in those gyms to kind of uh, uh, bring more, you know, color and highlight our uh, buildings in that way. So uh, they got together, created the book, and it was Elizabeth who um, sent it over to the Minnesota Historical Society, and they eventually published it, and now it's out there for the world. And since then, we've actually seen some pictures of children reading this book. When you watch them read, what do you think that they're taking away from it? Um, well, I guess some things I've heard from the kids is they like, uh, there's little, uh, egg, um, the like hints of red lake in there, like the red lake nation flag is in there. The, the red lake water tower that you see in our town here is in it, you know, um, Jonathan thunder in his unique artistic way, drop those little Easter eggs in there. And then, um, it's, it's cool to see that they're gaining some knowledge about Ojibwe culture in that way. And it's even more cool to see non-Indigenous or non-Ojibwe, you know, kids and people pick up this book and they can learn a piece of our culture in this way. So it's, uh, it's, it's really empowering to see young people read this book and learn about their culture. I could imagine for the young people who are reading the book, as you said, who see their tribal flag reflected in the book, who see the water tower, I imagine that that means so much to them, um, you know, to see them represented on pages of a children's book. It is, you know, um, it's something we try to do at our Boys and Girls Club is, you know, expose them to Anishinaabe values and culture and to, you know, let them know that you could be proud of being from Red Lake and be proud of being Ojibwe. So when they see things in like this professionally made book, it's like, hey, I, I know that flag. I, 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 I live by that water tower. To see those things, it's, um, you know, hopefully it's one more thing that makes them feel proud about being Red Lake. Yeah, you're actually an artist in your own right. Um, tell us about your work and um, uh, you know what that means to you. Yeah, so I'm a hip hop artist and poet and um, it's a art form I've been doing for roughly 10, 12 years. I've you know, toured around the country and I've done different types of music festivals and events. I've done a lot of different you know native communities and reservations. And I guess uh, to sum up, my music is I, I just talk about where I'm from, you know, I'm, I'm from the Red Lake Reservation, you know, and I try to talk about my upbringing and my the day to day life of an of a indigenous person living in these times. And I, you know, do my best to incorporate some culture and uh, some of our own uh, Anishinaabe music into it. I've done songs where I just rap over the round dance tempo on a hand drum and my friend Brendan Strong will sing. So I've, uh, you know, tried to take my skills as a rap artist and mix in our Ojibwe music and culture as well. 
We've actually had Brendan Strong on our newscast to talk about his running. I, I think I love an Indian country because um, everyone is so interconnected. So it's wonderful to visit with the both of you. Oh, yeah. Brendan's uh, he's an amazing singer and artist and uh, he's a good friend of mine. So it's, um, you know, we've utilized my music here at the Boys and Girls Club, too. Uh, um, so my MC name would be Thomas X. So you could um, find uh, some of our music that's through our Boys and Girls Club on our YouTube page. So the Boys and Girls Club has its own YouTube page as well. Uh, we have a song called I'm Anishinaabe, which is another project we did during the pandemic. It was shot entirely by um, club members who were working the drone because the idea was, you know, during the early days of the pandemic, you know, we got to be distant. So to do the videography side of things, people were flying the drone. And then we had club members who are a part of our drum and dance group dancing in regalia. And uh, we put the song out there. So it was just another way to combine different programs during the pandemic. And uh, I want to give a shout out to our drum and dance program. They'll be performing at the Boys and Girls Club Native Summit in Orlando, Florida in November. So our, you know, our kids who sing and dance at the drum and dance and regalia are actually getting some national recognition for their talents. Well, we'll definitely have to look for that. Thomas, thank you so much. Miigwech, thank you. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.